Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, part of our Agilent Cell Analysis Global Conference. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoot, and I'll be our moderator for today's event. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I now present today's speaker, Brad Larson, a field application scientist at Biotech Instruments. For a complete biography on Brad, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Brad, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, sir. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, I'm Brad Larson from Biotech Instruments. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event and Agilent for asking me to speak to you today as part of the Immuno-Oncology and Cancer Biology Virtual Conference. The field of cancer research has seen a number of advances aimed at increasing the efficacy of treatments, reducing toxic side effects, and decreasing attrition rates of drug candidates. These include the increased use of immunotherapies, as well as the use of 3D cell culture techniques and primary or stem cell derived organoids that work together to create in vitro models that better mimic the in vivo environment. Today, I'm going to focus specifically on how uh, 3D T cell mediated cytotoxicity, tumor invasion, and small intestinal organoid assay procedures can be monitored using digital bright field or fluorescent wide field microscopy and quantified using cellular analysis techniques. Before looking further at the applications though, I'd like to give just a short background on biotech for those not familiar with our company. Biotech was founded in 1968 by Dr. Norman Alpert, a professor and researcher at the University of Vermont. And since our early days, the company has had a focus on instrumentation for microplates that continued over 50 years. Then in 2019, Biotech became a part of Agilent and is now positioned within Agilent's cell analysis. Throughout biotech's history, we have focused on four main instrumentation segments. Liquid handling, including washing, PMT-based microplate reader detection, robotics to accommodate multi-plate applications, and finally imaging and microscopy. With a variety of instruments, that I just mentioned, we are able to help scientists and clinicians performing research not only in immuno-oncology and other types of cancer, but also research within a wide variety of disease fields, as well as environmental research, agricultural research, and more. So now if we begin to look at the individual applications, the first that I'm going to cover demonstrates a way to analyze T cell activation as part of, as part of adoptive T cell therapy and then use the activated T cells in a downstream T cell mediated cytotoxicity assay. The entire process consists of three portions that are carried out over an 18 day period. The first is the directed activation of the T cell. In the second, the target cancer cells are plated in a 2D or 3D manner. And then in the third, the stained activated T cells are added to the target cells and the T cell induced cytotoxicity of target cells is monitored over the next uh, seven days. So in the next slides, we'll focus on performing imaging and analysis of T cell activation. The two instruments that were used to complete the project are Cell Imaging Multimode Reader and the BioSpot 8 Automated Incubator. 
the Citation 5 combines the ability to perform PMT-based microplate reading and automated digital uh, microsco microscopy in one instrument. On the microscopy side, the instrument can capture images using bright field, color bright field, phase contrast, and fluorescence modes. The Citation 5 can hold up to six objectives, ranging from 1.25 to 60x, and can also be equipped with up to four fluorescence imaging cubes, with currently over 20 channels to choose from. The BioSpot 8 is a benchtop incubator that can hold not only micro, uh, microplates, but a wide variety of different uh, vessels. It's equipped with environmental controls for temperature and CO2, O2, as well as a water pan and the ability to monitor humidity. The robotic arm, as you see in the front of the instrument, automatically moves the plates from the bio spa to the connected liquid handler, reader, or imager at the appropriate time as described in the bio spa scheduling software. For this particular project, following setup of the T-cell activation assay, the plates were placed into the bio spa for incubation and at times the plates were moved to the Citation 5 where bright field imaging was carried out. The setup of the T-cell activation was performed in the following manner. We carried out a directed activation where T-cells are cultured in the presence of the MDA-MB231 target cells, which secrete cell several soluble factors, including cytokines, to increase T cell proliferation and sensitize the T cells to enhance their ability to seek out the specific target cancer cells when used in cell mediated cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxicity application. However, we also realized that we needed to separate the T cells and target cells at the end of the experiment to only move the T cells onto the next portion of the process. So, to do this, we incorporated nano shuttle paramagnetic particles from Griner Bio One. The particles were first attached to the target cells and aggregated together by placing the 24 well plate on top of a 384 well magnet, creating the target cell configuration that you can see in the picture in the slide. To test the effect of directed activation, to different wells we added varying concentrations of tablast ranging from 100% target cells and no fibroblasts to 0% target cells and 100% fibroblasts. T cells were then added to the wells in addition to anti-CD3, anti-CD28, and a range of IL-2 superkine to start activation. An overview of the entire activation process then looks like this. Again, we see the target being added on day one and aggregated on top of the 384 weld magnet for four days. On day five, media is removed and the T cells are added along with anti CD3 and anti CD28 antibodies and IL2 superkine to begin the activation process. The plate is added to the biospa for three days and transferred to the Citation 5 every six hours to capture bright field images of each well to monitor activation before being transferred back to the bio spa. On day eight, the plate is again placed on top of the 384 well magnet, spent media is removed, and fresh media with antibodies and superkine is added. Activation continues for another three days before the, uh, before the plate is placed back onto the 384 well magnet a final time, and T cells are removed for staining. The IL-2 superkind that we used was from adipogen. It is a variant of IL-2 that contains mutations to allow the superkind to bind to IL-2 receptors with a high affinity. And the reason for using this superkind is that the end result of the mutations is that compared to native IL-2, the superkind provides superior expansion of cytotoxic and effector T cells which elicit, which elicit a diminished uh, uh, toxic effect on those cells during the activation process. So then for imaging, in order to capture images of the entire well, 
a 12 row by 10 column montage was set up in the Gen 5 imaging procedure. What you're seeing here in this slide is a portion of that montage. Then following the completion of each imaging iteration performed every six hours, the images were stitched to image processing step also in Gen 5. As images were captured kinetically, you can also create movie files to visualize the effect of the treatment in each well. The kinetic images I'm going to show you the left were from a well seeded with 500,000 T cells, um, followed by antibodies and 100 uh, nanograms per mil IL-2 superkine, while the images on the right were from an, um, a negative control well, again, seeded with 500,000 um, T cells and antibodies, but no IL-2 superkine. So I'll start those uh, movie files now. And as you can see from the kinetic image movie file, there's a dramatic increase in T cell proliferation and cell clumping in well can plus IL-2 superkine, which is as expected, as increased proliferation and clumping are, are a common phenotypic indicator of T cell activation. To quantify the level of activation, confluence measurements were conducted on captured images. Using an image analysis step in the GEN software, a threshold signal in the bright field channel is established. The way this is done is that a line can be drawn across a portion of the image to see the actual signal in areas of background and areas containing cells, which you can see was done here on this slide. In the graph on the left, you can see that areas of the image containing fewer cells have a higher signal. And then when our drawn line goes through an area of highly clumped cells, the signal drops dramatically. The threshold value that is chosen includes areas of the image containing cells and have a low bright field signal, which in the image shown are in black or the blue color while background areas of the image containing no cells and having a higher signal, again, in the image I'm showing here are in yellow, are excluded. The final result is a normalized uh, uh, conflict. And the image here uh, containing a large number of cells was determined to be 73.8% confluent. When confluence values are plotted over time from wells containing either 100,000 or 500,000 T cells for all the different concentrations of the IL-2 superkine tested, you can see how increased levels of the superkine cause an increase in confluence. And then by calculating the area under the curve for the two cell, for the two T cell concentrations, either based upon superkine concentration or time, we can infer that increases in both positively affect the level of T cell activation. So then in the next portion of the project, um, this involved the performance of the T cell mediated cytotoxicity assay. The same instrumentation setup, including the Citation 5 and the BioSpa was used. Here, after the test plates were prepared, they were placed into the BioSpa and again automatically transferred to the citation, this time to perform both bright field and fluorescence imaging. Using those images, cellular analysis methods were run to determine T-cell-induced target cell cytotoxicity over time. If we look back to see how this fits into the original project workflow, we see that on day nine, the target cell model, which included uh, co-cultured fibroblasts, was added to the spheroid plates and aggregated together for 48 hours to create the 3D model. The same was repeated on day 10 in 2D. Then on day 11, T cells were added to the ratios of 20 to 1, 10 to 1 or 5 to 1 compared to the number of co-cultured target cells. 
The plates were placed into the BioSpa, as previously explained, and automatically transferred to the citation every four hours, this time to perform the bright field and fluorescent imaging. This continued over a seven-day period. The layout here shows the different combinations that were tested in the cell-mediated cytotoxicity app. T cells that were activated using different levels of directed activation, as indicated by the different colors, were combined with target cells at varying ratios, as indicated by the different letters. This made for multiple combinations to be tested, including a no T cell negative control for each set of conditions. Images were captured every four hours using three different imaging channels um, to capture all cells in the cold culture, the propidium iodide channel to image necrotic cells, and the sci 5 channel to distinguish cell tracker deep red stained T cells from the other cell type. The first step when looking at the overlaid images of the 2D and 3D cultured cells was to confirm that T cells bound to the target cell models and then induced uh, target cell toxicity. As you can see from the overlaid Brightfield Sci-5 2D uh, cell image at the top left of the slide, the T cells are clustering around the target cells uh, within the image. For the image of the 3D culture target cells at the top right of the slide, you can also see a number of T cells binding to the 3D. What is also interesting here is that you can see that the rest of the T cells are moving towards the tumoroid. Uh, when we look at the overlaid Brightfield Propidium iodide images at the bottom of the slide, we can also see necrotic cells at the same positions of T cell binding, as witnessed by an increase in prop uh, Propidium iodide signal at those same locations. When looking at images captured over time, this time we're just looking at overlaid uh, propidium iodide and Sci 5 channel to better see the labeled T cells and induce uh, cytotoxicity. You can also see that the number of necrotic cells dramatically increase over time, confirming that uh, binding of the T cells to the target cells does induce a toxic effect on the target cells. The same can be said for the target cells cultured in 3D. Uh, this time, I've included the bright field channel with the PI and sci 5 channels, so you can see um, what happens to the tumoroid over time. Again, we see T cell clustering and binding, causing an increase in necrotic cells within the tumoroid. Then, by seven days of incubation, the tumoroid literally is destroyed by the T cell interaction, causing a dispersal of cells within the image. We can then use the captured images to visually ascertain the potential effect of the different conditions that were tested. When we first look at a T cell, um, a T cell concentration, in the three video clips of kinetically captured images I'm going to show you, you'll notice that T cell binding and the number of um, necrotic cells increases faster with an increased concentration of T cells. So I'm gonna start those video clips for you now. What you'll also notice from the 3D models, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that the tumoroids literally explode after exposure to the T cells. I'm just gonna show you each of those one more time to kind of let you really see what happens. Um, and this effect has been reported in other um, studies, so is, uh, is certainly not unexpected. The effect of the directed activation using the MDA MB231 breast cancer cells can also be visualized uh, by looking at images captured at the same time from wells uh, containing completely unactivated T cells or T cells activated with antibodies in IL-2 in the presence of either 0, 50, 75, or 100% target breast cell cancer, uh, target breast cancer cells, it is easy to see that directed activation enables the T cells to have a much greater cytotoxic effect 
on the cancer cell model. Cellular analysis was also performed on each captured image in order to quantify the level of induced cytotoxicity from the T-cell treatment. A separate analysis was performed for the target cells cultured either in 2D or 3D using optimized criteria. For 2D cultured cells, uh, minimum and maximum object size limits were set for individual necrotic cells, such as what you see um, in the image on the left of the slide. With target cells uh, cultured in 3D, the cells obviously exist as much larger uh, clusters, so um, even when the tumoroid begins to break apart. Therefore, minimum and maximum size limits uh, need to be increased to accommodate the change in cell configuration. Then finally, to limit the contribution of any dead T cells to the number uh, to the numbers coming out of the analysis, whether using 2D or 3D cultured cells, we use the fact that T cells have a much smaller size in relation to the target cancer cells and set a minimum object size that was larger than a T cell. Therefore, they would not be masked and would not skew the results of our analysis. So after performing the cellular analysis, we normalized the data to account for slight variations in, in cell plating. We did this in the following manner. For 2D cultured target cells, we divided the necrotic cell number at each time point for treated wells by the necrotic cell number for no T cell, uh, for the no T cell control well. A similar method was performed for 3D culture target cells. However, here, because cell counts were inaccurate due to the aggregated manner of the cancer cells, we used another metric generated by Gen5, that being the total propidium iodide signal coming from the captured image. When performing the normalization process, an interesting phenomenon was observed. If you look at the graph on the left of the slide for target cells cultured in 2D, you will see that the, um, the necrotic cell ratio for wells containing target cells and T cells that went through different levels of directed activation, target cell ratio rises quickly and in proportion to the level of activation as we would expect, but then drops just as quickly after approximately 24 hours of incubation. This is until we look at the black line in the graph, which is the number of necrotic uh, cells in the no T cell negative control well. What is happening is that the 2D culture target cells begin to lose viability after about 24 hours because of being cultured in 2D. So as the number of necrotic cells in the negative control goes up, the necrotic cell ratio goes down. If we look at the graph on the right side of the slide, however, for target uh, cancer cells cultured in 3D, we see that the cancer cells in the no T cell negative control wells maintain a much higher level of viability throughout the entire process. Therefore, the ratio of PI signal from treated wells compared to the PI signal from negative control wells uh, increases over time as we would expect. These results are a really great example of this type of long-term T-cell-mediated cytotoxicity experiment uh, makes the most sense using a 3D culture cancer cell model. In, um, in the 2D culture model, it is difficult to have confidence uh, after only 24 hours. However, with a 3D cancer cell model, one can be confident in the data generated all throughout the seven-day incubation period. This type of data normalization and comparison was also performed for wells containing 100% directly activated T cells at ratios of 20, 10, and 5 to 1 over uh, target cancer cell numbers. The effect of higher T cell ratios is quite obvious, causing a higher necrotic cell ratio for 2D cultured cells and a faster induction of target cell necrosis in, um, in 3D cultured cells. That the difference in the viability of the cancer cells over time, again, 
affects the ratios for 2D cultured cancer cells as it did in the previous comparison. Then finally, as I mentioned before, when using a 3D cell culture format for the target cell model, uh, incubation, when act, uh, incubate, incubation with activated T cells literally causes the, the tumoroid to disintegrate over time. This explosion causes a release of cells and extracellular matrix within the well that can be visualized using bright field imaging. The image at the top left shows a tumoroid at time zero that is still intact. Then with increased incubation, you can see in the image at the top right that the tumoroid breaks apart and the release of cells and extracellular matrix begins. This continues as you look at the image on the bottom left and finally the image at the bottom right. What is important to note is that no changes were made in exposure of any of these images or the, any changes in the brightness and contrast settings. The increased darkness is due to the scattering of the cells and ECM across the image and across the entire well. So using the, the imability in Gen 5 that I explained earlier to determine the confluence of the activated T cells, we can, um, can, we can perform the same type of measurement here by setting a threshold signal, once again, to include pixels in the image with a lower bright field signal and excluding pixels with a higher bright field signal, we can use confluence to also track uh, induced target cell necrosis. If we focus on the different T cell to choose, we see that, again, the confluence values increase the fastest for wells with a 20 to one ratio, followed by 10 to one and five to one. This demonstrates another way that induced cytotoxicity can be measured using a 3D uh, target cell cancer model and label-free imaging. Moving away from amino oncology now, in the second project that I'm going to talk about, uh, we were again looking to demonstrate a method using the citation imager and biospa to accurately image and analyze another 3D model in a kinetic fashion over a seven-day period. This time, as part of a means to assess the metastatic ability of our target uh, cancer cell models and ways to inhibit invasion. One tumoroid model consisted of co-cultured GFP-expressing U87 glioblastoma cells known to be highly metastatic and RFP-expressing primary fibroblasts, while the other consisted of a far less invasive glioblastoma multiforme cell line, LN229, stained with cell tracker deep red, and again, RFP expressing fibroblasts. To image all the different cell types, we used Brightfield to capture the complete invading structure, the GFP channel to image the U87 cells, the RFP channel to image the fibroblasts, and the Psi-5 channel to image the LN229 cells. Again, because of the capacity of the Citation 5, all the fluorescence imaging cubes for these channels could be installed on the instrument at the same time, so imaging of all channels could be accomplished in the same run. Also, because of the size of the invading structures, we added a three row by two column montage to ensure that no portions of the invading tumoroids were missed in, um, in the captured images. These were then stitched back together following image capture. In addition, because in being placed in the X, Y, and Z planes, we incorporated a 20 site V stack. Um, a Z projection algorithm was applied to the captured images uh, to take the most in-focus portions of each image and return a final in-focus image that could be used for analysis. And once again, as uh, previously mentioned, image capture took place in a kinetic fashion every 12 hours over a seven-day period. An advantage of being able to image not only the complete invading 3D structure, but also the individual cell types in our co-culture is that you can determine the invasive ability of each cell type. In the U87 fibroblast co-culture, when looking at the GFP image, 
you can see that the U87 glioblastoma cells are highly invasive as expected, whereas by looking at the RFP image, you see that the fibroblasts are much less invasive and tend to stay within the original spheroidal area. The extent of invasion can also be quantified using methods similar to what I'm going to demonstrate in a few slides. As I mentioned uh, previously, to accurately image tumoroid invasion, we incorporated a number of uh, capabilities available within the Gen5 software. U87 glioblastoma mults are highly invasive. Therefore, over the seven-day incubation period, the podia extend out away from the original embedded spheroid to a great deal, as you can see in the images on the slide. The three row by two column montage of which I'm showing for the images captured here, centered in the middle of the well, ensured that all areas of the invading structure were captured within the six total image if the spheroids were slightly off center after the addition of the matrix gel overlay. Then if you look at the images on this slide, you can see that the six image tiles from the montage are able to be stitched together to create accurate, complete images of the invading tumoroid. The four pictures on the left of the slide also demonstrate how images of invasion were captured in the stack. 20 total slices were taken, but I'm only showing uh, four here for simplicity's sake. You can see at the different Z heights that various portions of the structure are in focus. Then when we apply the Z projection algorithm to create the final stitched Z projected images, on the right side of the slide, you can see how all portions of the tumoroid, including the invadipodia, are in focus. This is accomplished in stitching and Z projection algorithms for all time points within the kinetic, whether early on, when little invasion has taken place and the tumoroids are smaller, or at the later stages of invasion when invadipodia have extended out into the major gel to a much greater extent. The final step of the process was to quantify the extent of invasion. Two separate cellular analyses were performed on the images captured during our, in, um, our inhibitor experiment using a titration of the selective HSP inhibitor 17AAG. In the first, the primary cellular analysis capabilities in, uh, available in Gen5 were used. In addition to changes in bright field signal within the image between pixels containing portions of the tumoroid and background to place scaled object is the one um, that you see in the picture at the top left of the slide around the complete invading 3D structure, despite the level um, of compound treatment. When the area at each time point is normalized to the original area of the tumoroid at time zero to create a ratio and then plotted over time, you can see how the different concentrations of 17-AAG inhibitor inhibit invasion in a dose-dependent uh, manner. A second cellular analysis was also performed using the primary and secondary cellular analysis capabilities available in Gen 5 to measure the area solely covered by non-invading cells within the tumoroid. In order to determine the, meta, uh, the metastatic ability of 3D in vitro models, whether uninhibited or following treatment, it is important to be able to distinguish between area covered by cells within the original tumoroid and that covered by invadipodia. As the more densely packed non-invasive propagating cells appear darker compared to invadipodia in a bright field image, as you can see by um, looking at the outer edges of the tumoroid in the top picture, closer to the yellow uh, object mask, this additional change in signal in the original placement of a secondary mask to exclude the invading areas of each tumoroid and separate the area covered by the two portions of the entire 3D structure. By applying the secondary mask around non-invasive uh, non portions of the tumoroid, 
differences in the invasive qualities of the two glio, uh, glioblastoma multiforme cell types uh, were tested we, that we tested then become clear. The area covered by Invadipodia for U87 fibroblast tumoroids increases dramatically over the seven-day incubation period. LN229 fibroblast tumoroids, by comparison, show little increase in, in uh, and in beta podia over the same time. This dual analysis, therefore, has the potential to determine not only how rapidly tumoroid cells are propagating, but also the invasive nature of the cell model. In the final portion of my presentation, I'm going to cover imaging and analysis of organoid models, specifically 3D small intestinal organoids. Organoids made from primary cells or stem cells or excised from primary tumors are being used with greater frequency as they not only take advantage of the benefits of being cultured in 3D, they also contain appropriate cell types that have not been immortalized, potentially introducing unwanted changes in cell function. Small intestinal organoids, for instance, are now being used in oncology research as part of gastrointestinal infectious disease research and even toxicity studies. Small intestinal organoids by um, embedding intestinal crypts or stem cells into major gel or collagen form three-dimensional structures throughout the well within the hydrogel. Therefore, it's necessary, again, to be able to image the organoids using a Z-stacking procedure. The movie files made from Z-stack images uh, show how different portions of the structure, including budding like structures, captured at the varying Z height. And I'm going to show you those movie files now for two um, organoids that we captured using bright field imaging. Again, I'll show you that one more time. Uh, Z projection algorithms, again, create uh, final in focus images that can be used for a variety of events you're seeing here. And then to perform simple label-free analyses to determine organoid size and area, changes in bright field signal can be used to, to place cellular analysis object masks around the objects, such as you see in the picture at the top left of the slide. Uh, addition of a digital phase contrast processing step can also be performed on the bright field images. Digital phase contrast is an algorithm in Gen 5 that creates a phase contrast-like image from the bright field one, as you see in the image at the bottom right of the slide. This processing step can then increase the contrast between um, areas of the image containing the organoid and background, increasing the accuracy of object masking, creating two methods to perform um, analysis. Another common analysis performed with intestinal organoids is to monitor organoid health after treatment. Healthy organoids, as you saw in the previous slides, and as I'll show here, continue to create crypts that contain stem cells which butt off of the main spheroidal uh, structure. If the organoids are treated or modified in any way, affects health, the budding process will be greatly diminished or cease altogether, leaving the original uh, round sphere. So then to perform um, the analysis, even though you're seeing a DAPI RFP bright field channel overlay in the picture on the left, only the bright field image is required. Masking of the organoids is performed, as I explained in the previous slide, and then a custom metric is created in the Gen 5 software to create or to calculate spikiness, which takes into account the area and perimeter of each masked object. You can see the spikiness 
uh, formula near the bottom right of the slide, which takes into account the organoid's uh, circularity index. Organoid area is in the numerator of the organoid perimeter is in the denominator. As you can see in the picture on the right side of the slide, healthy budding organoids have a much longer perimeter than non-budding organoids that are much more cylindrical. The larger perimeter value decreases the fraction, and when that number is subtracted from one, the final stickiness value increases. You can see in the two organoids that I have picture that the spikiness value correlates well to organoids with a higher degree of budding. A second way that organoid health can be quantified is by performing a count of the buds containing the stem cells. Because the stem cells are highly proliferative, when adding an EDU proliferation fluorescent probe, the buds will emit a bright signal, whereas other areas of the organoid emit little to no signal, which uh, you can see in the RFP image in the middle of the slide. Using the bright field signal from the complete organoid and the RFP signal from the EU stain, a spot counting procedure is set up in Gen 5. First, a primary mask is placed around the entire organoid using the, cha uh, the change in bright field signal, as I explained in the previous slide. Spots are then applied to treat each bud as a spot. Now, typically, spots are very small in size, so here, minimum and maximum object size are increased to, uh, to accommodate the size of the buds. Using the change in RFP signal, masks are placed around the buds and the number of spots is counted and linked to each organoid. By comparing the average spot count you know, uh, to the treatment, the effect on organoid health can then be assessed. So in conclusion, the Citation 5 or Citation 5 in combination with the BioSpa provides easy to perform robust methods uh, to perform a variety of oncology applications. If you'd like to learn more about what I've covered here today, I invite you to visit our this page on biotech.com. Here, here you can assess a number of different published application notes, guides, and white papers. You can also talk to your local sales personnel and field scientists to get the answers that you need. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Brad, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the room. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. So let's start. We already have some great questions coming in from our audience members. Our first question is, in cell-mediated cytotoxicity experiment, the key cells were labeled the fluorescent dye. Could other cell types in a co-culture also be seen? Thank you, Susie. That's a great question. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, we certainly have done this with um, a number of um, other applications, as well as uh, out in the field within um, uh, quite a few different customers that are looking to create, you know, as I, as I mentioned previously in my talk, more advanced um, co-cultures where they're mixing, uh, if we go back to the T-cell example, um, their cancer cell um, model, plus uh, potentially um, T cells or CAR T cells, macrophages, so on and so forth. And each of those um, cell types uh, can certainly be stained with different um, cell tracker dyes, or there's other types of methods to, um, uh, to stain cells um, uh, before they're added together. And then again, with the, the four different imaging channels that the citation can hold at one time, you can see you know, um, either the, the combination of all the cell types together uh, with something like uh, Brightfield, 
um, or you can use the individual fluorescence channels to see the effect of, of each individual cell type um, in a cold culture. Thank you for that. And for cancer invasion tracking, if you wanted to track invasion for, let's say, an extended period of time, such as longer than seven days, does biotech have a solution to keep fresh media on the invading tumor rights? Another great, uh, right, right, yep, yep. Another great, great question. And this is something that's asked of us um, quite quite a number of times, whether that's for, uh, you know, people looking to do uh, tumor invasion, or if you think about other types of um, applications that take, uh, you know, a week or weeks at a time, like uh, stem cell differentiation, um, uh, other or the the um, induced cytotoxicity applications again um, those can you know literally take weeks you know 21 28 days is is not uncommon so of course um, you know it's it's one thing to uh, to put um, cell models whether they're 3D uh, or 2D into um, you know into an imager an Im imager and an incubator. But of course, um, even with, with 3D, after a certain amount of time, uh, the media starts to lose, you know, um, the, uh, the components um, that uh, uh, the cells are going to need to maintain viability. So what we can do actually is um, whether we uh, combine this as an kind of an online system with the uh, the biospa and the citation that I talked about um, earlier, uh, you can combine a third instrument, which would be a, um, a liquid handler that um, then can be accessed with the robot. And basically, um, we have developed a new method that uh, with, with the, the liquid handler um, called the Multiflow FX, um, this can be fitted with um, uh, with peristaltic pumps and cassettes that are specialized to work with unattached cell models, um, such as uh, obviously um, you know 3D cell models which are unattached and free floating in a well, or uh, with the you know the high interest in immuno oncology with uh, immune cells, which obviously are suspension cells, so are not going to be attached as well. And the, the caveat of using this system is that uh, with the peristaltic pumps, you have the ability to uh, have a very fine control of the aspiration speed and the dispense speed of the liquid either coming out of the well or going into the well. And you can also move the pins, the tubes that are going to be used for aspiration and dispense away from the cell model uh, to make sure that you're not aspirating the cells up, uh, obviously during the media exchange, you know, um, to, to avoid that. So, um, so that really um, gives the ability to then, again, like I said, either with the Biospa, this can be done um, in a complete automated fashion. So maybe you want to perform your imaging every, you know, six hours, 12 hours, whatever that would be, and then you can uh, perform a media exchange once a day, um, and all of that can be programmed. Now, if you don't want to have that level of automation, then you can just have the multi-flow effects by itself. It's a very small um, instrument. It's maybe you know about two feet by a foot and a half by about a foot and a half. It can easily fit into a tissue culture hood and be run as a standalone um, instrument as well. So it really, again, gives you the ability to um, maintain um, viability by being able to, to put on fresh media when needed, uh, but without um, having that worry of, am I going to lose my cells when I'm performing these media um, exchanges? Thank you for that. And we have time for one more question. Does biotech have experience imaging primary patient tumors? Right. Um, another great question, because obviously, you know, all, all day long, you know, people have been talking about using, um, you know, cell models and, and, you know, more advanced techniques to be able to 
perform your in vitro testing in a way that's really getting as close to an in vivo model um, as possible. Really, of course, you know, that's the name of the game when you're looking for, uh, you know, for developing new treatments um, for cancer treatments, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for different types of cancer. So um, we certainly have um, had uh, a number of researchers that are using our instruments, um, not just use, um, you know, uh, again, in, in my last example, I talked about organoids that were created from stem cells, but literally what they're doing is they're working in, in cooperation with a hospital or clinic where, um, you know, they are having, um, you know, tumor uh, biopsies that are then, you know, taken to their, um, uh, their lab, whether that's at the, um, uh, at the university or in a uh, uh, pharmaceutical biotech setting. Um, and then they're, you know, they're taking small portions of that, either putting it in um, the wells of a microplate or on a dish or on a slide. Um, and then, you know, performing that type of imaging again, which, which, you know, obviously is, is a three-dimensional model. It's not necessarily a sphere, but it's still a three-dimensional um Model. So, so yes, we, we certainly can do that. Um, and then, you know, certain different um, uh, probes um, can be added uh, to enable to see different, you know, um, again, certain cell types or certain um, um, phenotypic uh, types of um, uh, effects um, with the, with the, you know, these primary, um, you know, cancer tumor um models. So, um, so yeah, I would, again, I would, you know, we have lots of um, examples of, of this. And, you know, like I said, the other, you know, the other things that I've talked about in the, um, in the presentation. So I guess maybe to, to close before we close, I'll just mention one more time that, um, you know, if, if anybody would like to learn more, Certainly, you know, a, a great place to start is our um, is our website, and you can look at all the different applications. But we have an, a really a great wealth of um, field scientists, uh, not only in the U.S. but you know all all across the world, um, that can certainly help you out um, and answer any questions that um, that you might have. We all work together as a team to make sure that you're getting you know the information that you need. And you know the most out of the um, the instruments that you're um, that you're using. I want to thank you again, Brad, for sharing this information with us today. Brad Lawson, thank you. And I want to thank our audience for your questions and for your participation. Have a great day. Until next time. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone.